So I mean, when you look at things and you say why, what, when, where, and how, I think everything starts falling together. You have a product, you don't have a market, you have to create the market. You have a market, you don't have a product, you have to create the product. When you have a market and you have a product, you need to scale it. You can look at Steve Jobs, you can look at Bill Gates, you can look at uh, Ratan Tata. You got to pick up what is it that they have done or they have that applies to you. I came from a culture where if I don't go to college, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Whether it's right or wrong is a different thing. But as long as I know what I cannot do and what I will not do, then life becomes easier because my window becomes smaller for me to play. So India is a very important market. Rolls Royce is not in automobiles like many of the people would like to think. Why is India very important? There's 1.4 billion folks. That light will continue to shine and people who don't partake in that light will have to probably see the others grow. So ladies and gentlemen, very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where you're joining us from, for this leadership masterclass on Towards a Better World on Thinkly, where I, Ayan Banerjee, your host, speak to some of the most inspirational people from all walks of life. Today's episode is extra special for me because I am hosting one of my favorite ex-bosses at G. Before we get into the session, let me give you some background about G leaders for context. The first time I set foot on G's Crotonville campus in the US for the first rotation of my leadership program, it was a fanboy moment for me, if you know what I mean. During the next few weeks, we spent time with several senior G leaders, including many of whom who had served under the legendary Jack Welch. As the days went by and our class was gradually GEized by some of the best corporate leaders in the contemporary world, I was by habit joining the dots. Uh, connecting the G that I had read so much about to the G that I was experiencing. And there's a confession. I was secretly trying to find disconnects, if any. Here's what, you know what? There were no disconnects. This was the first thing that hit me about G. An incredible sense of transparency, candor, and homogeneity of affairs. The next thing that struck me was a deep-seated pride for the organization in every employee that we met. Then there were other things, of course, integrity, fair play, and this intense desire to win every time. Never had I seen such diversity of ideas, backgrounds, and domains in one room. And yet, there was this strange thread that bound them and made them one. Somewhere along the way, we too would go ahead and shed a bit of our individuality and acquire a bit of G into our personalities. Something that would stick with us in the years to come, whether or not we continue to work with G or not. I mean, as they say, it's a one-way street. So now, graduating from the program, when I took over the role of a sales director with G's flagship gas turbine business in South Asia, I got to work under Mr. Kishore Jairaman, who was our CEO for the G energy business for South Asia. The next 18 months probably were the most rewarding and fulfilling months in my entire professional journey that far which went on went uh, uh, like a whirlwind when our team kept breaking new ground every other day. And we hit a historically high number, which is still unmatched, by the way, 13 years down the line. And such was the aura of Kishore's leadership. And after a long and illustrious career at G, which had begun at G in the US, where he had risen up the ranks very rapidly and then led G India to such huge heights, Kishore joined Rolls-Royce as their president and CEO for South Asia, where again, I think he joined in March 2012, if I'm not mistaken, and where again he was responsible for taking the organization to great heights in the past one decade. Among the several accolades that Kishore has been awarded with, he was recently awarded the honorary officer of the Order of the British Empire for his contributions to strengthening of the UK-India trade ties. I just cannot hold my excitement as I welcome Kishore for this Leadership 101. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Kishore Jairaman to Towards a Better World. Kishore, welcome to Towards a Better World. Thank you, Ayan. Good to see you. It's been a while. And uh, thank you very much for your kind words and uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Kishore, the pleasure is entirely mine and ours and everyone else's who has joined in listening to you. It's, it's a rare privilege for us to be listening to you, Kishore. Thanks for taking time for out of your busy schedule. So since I don't want to wish a single moment while you are live with us, let me dive into the first question, Kishore, which is about your educational background. 
Uh, your educational background is a rare combination of someone with an MS and an MBA from the US, which positions you with a unique techno-commercial academic resume. And we also know, I know personally, that you are a big supporter of academics and you are also an advisor to some prestigious educational institutions yourself. So in a world today where we are getting increasingly disillusioned about the effectiveness of formal education, what's your view in retrospect today on the impact of formal higher education on your career? I mean, if I were to ask you to deconstruct it today, what has been more rewarding from your education? Was it the critical thinking skills that you got from your uh, Ivy League education? Or was it the alum network that it gave you, Kishore? Hmm, interesting. I've not been asked uh, that question before, Ayo. I think uh, that's a very interesting question. And uh, look, I, I usually believe that for any leader, um, there are key, three key drivers, right? And I think the, the first one in that is going to be learning. And um, the second one in there is going to be legacy. And I think the third one is about leadership, right? So we will just talk about the learning piece here for a minute because you asked me the question about my education. Look, when I started, I was a mechanical engineer, bachelor's, and uh, it was the obvious thing to get a master's degree in mechanical engineering in the times that I was growing up. So the education piece, I come from India and the culture is that we all get educated first and then get into the workshop. And um, you know, in my case, it was the same. So I got educated first, so I needed to be an engineer. So I became an engineer. And then in the, it was not, in those days, it was not a question of what you wanted to be. It was a question of engineer, doctor, and pretty much it. And uh, so I became an engineer and I learned to love mechanical engineering as I went through the process. I think it's a wonderful field. And uh, then I did my master's in the same area and it just happened that what I did as my thesis matched with what GE was doing in real life. And so GE was doing process automation of steel mills, which was basically about heat transfer in a hot rolling mill. And um, my thesis was about heat transfer in an investment casting process. And so when, that is the reason why GE hired me in the first place to do a, as a process models design engineer. And I was doing pure mathematical models and I was basically taking that into feedback control systems and then implementing them at site. So this was my job. This was my first job in 1989. And um, that's where my career began. And as I went through the process for about 10 or 12 years down the lane, I started moving from a technical job more and more into a commercial job. So I became a project manager around 96, 97. And around that time, because I became more and more commercial, and I started enjoying the commercial side of things. And, um, but in order, if you're going to be in the commercial side, then it's good to understand what is business. And if you're going to be in the business leadership side, it's very important to understand what is business. And so that's when I decided I'll do my evening MBA. Um, I was in Atlanta, Georgia at the time, and I was managing Africa, India, Middle East, and Asia all these regions. And uh, at that time, I also did my evening MBA. You were a commercial director at that time. Sure. That is correct. Yes, oh, I was commercial okay. director in uh, for GE Energy Services. Right. So, and, yeah. uh, and the good thing about that was that, you know, it kind of corroborated everything that I looked at in real life. So whenever I did a deal and I was doing contracts and I looked at some of the terms in the contract, I was learning insurance in uh, my MBA class. And I come and apply the insurance principles and philosophies and look at a contract. So it was like really corroborating the knowledge I was gaining in, uh, in sort of my daily job, my day job. And then as I moved away after my MBA, the primary reason for the MBA was only because I wanted to be in business leadership. And, uh, and I think MBA is very important for the foundations of business leadership. G did a lot of the other leadership side of things. And, um, but at the end of the day, when I combine my engineering background and my business background, I find that there is a, there's always, there's a unique combination that happens. And you will notice so many students always do engineering from India. They go to the US for an MBA. And as I, you know, as I moved along in my life, I've seen even today as I speak, I know um, kids of my friends who have finished engineering from one of the top engineering schools in the United States but after about two, three years work experience, they go and get themselves an MBA. Okay. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination made in heaven, engineering and MBA. And I think for anybody who wants to be in engineering at the end of the day, engineering is part of the business. 
And so for them to understand business while they also have the engineering background puts them in a very strong position for products-based businesses where technology matters. And so for me, being in gas turbines, which is one of the high-end technology products, first in GE with the energy and now with Rolls-Royce with aerospace and defense, you know, I think it is, it is one of those things where my technical background allows me to quickly address the issues of the customers. But at the same time, appreciate the fact that we need to make money and we just cannot be pure technocrats. So I think you know that is what it was it was all about. And I'm very thankful that I made those decisions I made of going to the evening MBA. And if I hadn't done that, I'd have probably never knew a lot of things that you know I was actually practicing. But now that there's theory and there's practice, I think it just helped me uh, through my journey. But then that said, I think even after that, I think there were so many times we had to keep learning, updating. You know, today the world is very different. Today, we have data analytics, artificial intelligence. We have, you know, various means. And I'll be honest with you. I think things have not changed. It is just that we have more storage. We have more computing power. So your ability to sparse the data, analyze the data, and provide with predictive and reactive uh, maintenance activities, regardless of the sectors or industries, is just phenomenal. We didn't have all those in those days. I remember my very first computer. We had to fight for it. Only field engineers got it because we had to go to the customer site. So anyways, uh, like I said, I think it's learning is very good. I think engineering MBA is a wonderful combination. And uh, I believe it was just my progression in life that brought me to getting both those uh, sort of uh, theory side of things covered. Awesome. So learning, leadership, and uh, legacy. I mean, what uh, the three L's of the Kishore Jairaman School of Leadership, if if I may. I mean, that's that's what you know. Aspiring leaders uh, should take away from this. And as someone who has worked for Kishore, I can I can totally attest the thing that he said about a technical person who understands technology, and at the same time, very rarely, uh, normally technical people, the geeks who understand only technology don't understand money. But Kishore is someone who understands business so well. And uh, just for the record, uh, under Kishore, we hit uh, more than a billion dollars in G energy in India. And it's a number which is still untouched 13 years after Kishore has left the company. So you can, you can make out from that how much he understands business and and so yeah the other day kishore you know john planary was on the podcast and he he was mentioning fondly about you about the reliance deal and everything that you know the g energy that was what gave him this you know jump board you know uh, from g india he took the next role so he was very fondly remembering you uh, during the podcast kishore so thank you thank you great answer great answer kishore so now <clears throat> After these great lessons, let's talk of people, because I know that this is a topic that is very close to your heart and very close to your leadership style. And you've often, I've often heard you say, and you also say it in public, that business is all about people. Now, as a leader who grew quite rapidly early on in your career and all the three broad phases in your illustrious journey, you know, uh, as I was mentioning, as, a, as an author, I, I study Indian leaders. So I have studied your journey. Your, you have, I can broadly segment it into three phases. So your growth through the ranks in GE in the US, your stellar achievements as the GE Energy CEO in India, and the past decade at Rolls-Royce, each of these stints would have called for completely different leadership playbooks and which would have involved uh, building teams around you while simultaneously managing leadership orbits above you to drive successful organizational journeys and transformations. So if you could share with us, Kishore, your people leadership style, I mean, how do you get buy-ins for your vision from above you and also from below you and around you? Yeah, interesting. Interesting, but... Uh... Yeah, I am very, very, uh, I think I'm very lucky that being born an Indian, I grew up in the Indian culture, then I moved to the US, I got a sample of the US culture for about 18 years, and then I moved to India, and I got a sample of how to work between US and India, and then I had this opportunity to move to Rolls-Royce, and so now it was a British culture, and uh, so it gave me an opportunity to work with British, European cultures, American previously, Indian background. I don't think you'll find many people who kind of do that. Sure. But uh, the reason for that, I think at the end of the day, people are just human, human beings. 
And I think we have to understand that fundamentally, if we treat each other respectfully, we don't make each business um, call a personal matter. And we all under, try to understand what the other person's needs are. And we try to make sure that we work around it without losing without losing the focus of what we really have started this whole collaborative work for. So for instance, when we wanted to solve, solve the double issue, right? I mean, it was, it meant with working with public sector units who were completely against having a long-term services agreement. We had, uh, we had GE, which firmly believed in the long-term service agreements along with our equipment. And the question was, how do you bring all these together in a way that people don't make it personal or people don't have to make it in a way that one has to win and the other has to fail. And I think if you constantly remind yourself of that, when we are trying to solve this, it usually makes the discussions easier. That's the first step. And when the discussions become easier, then I think it is a, the next step is to communicate, is to make sure we're communicating with enough people who are stakeholders or potential stakeholders and make sure they are in some form or fashion thinking about it. They don't have to agree with you, but they don't. They have to be thinking about it. And once they start thinking about it, then what happens is that the whole, you know, it's like flood waters coming in. And then all of a sudden you've created this channel wherein all the waters start flowing. And then the thinking process becomes everybody's thinking in that direction. So when we try to build a gas turbine business in India, we just had BHEL as a partner. But then going to the market and making sure, changing people's minds about saying, look, I don't want to be doing just gas turbines here that GE will come and sell. Here we have a partner. How do you go with this partner? And how do you make sure that we get the market share? Because the goal is to gain the market share. Sure. And so when you say the goal is market share, how do we bring BHL with us? How do we bring GE's connectivity with us? How do we bring France with us? And how do we bring all these people together so that they are able to channelize into that we are here to gain market share? Then things start working. And that takes lots of communication. That takes a lot of understanding and apathy. Right? It, take, it, takes, it takes a lot of work. Bottom line is it takes a lot of work. Right? And I think that's the same thing that worked for me in Rolls Royce as well. I remember weeks where I have met almost what 40, 50 people. And uh, right, and it's uh, it's just a, it, it is one of those times where you just go and try to talk about India and you talk about what's the, what's the out of the possible in India, what is it that India is going after, why is it beneficial for the UK, why is it beneficial for India. It is about that communications, I think. The communications with a clear agenda towards here is where we're going to go with this together and bringing the relevant stakeholders with you is what it is. That is the hard part. And once that is done, I think the rest is easy because the solutions automatically come together. Sure. Right? Solutions will always come together once people start working together for a common goal. But getting them aligned to that common goal uh, is probably the hardest part. And that only comes with patience, communications, and making sure nothing is taken personal. It is all for the benefit of the company that we all work for, right? or the countries we work for. And I think at that point in time, it just unravels. And uh, I think I've been, I've been very fortunate that I, I worked with phenomenal GE leaders and uh, now with Rolls Royce leaders. And I think uh, you know the journey for me has been one where I have given a lot and definitely learned a lot. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, you know, I can completely endorse, I, I haven't seen you, I haven't worked for you in Rolls Royce, but in GE, I can completely endorse what Kishore just mentioned on communication. You know, I know that Kishore is a relentless communicator. I mean, if I may use that term, I mean, I know that this is a gentleman who was our CEO of a billion dollar business, but he would be I think 20 days plus on the road and you would be constantly with customers. And, you know, Kishore, I remember that small anecdote. In those days, there was this movie which came out, George Clooney's Up in the Air. And this was uh, this was a favorite movie of yours. You, you said that, you know, I clocked more flying miles than George Clooney because I am always up in the air. So, so, so you know, Kishore was always with the customers uh, and yet he always found time for his own team. And 
in our town halls, you know, irrespective of how much busy his schedule was, he would find time to come to us and break it down, like, you know, into chunks and, you know, so that the last person in the value chain could understand what G is doing, because it is not so easy because the growth was very rapid because we grew from a small business to suddenly a billion dollar business. So to explain it to the last person in the value chain is not an easy task. And Kishore did a fabulous job of it. So thanks, Kishore. And I think that communication is the key for any leader who wants to get buy-ins from above and below them. So <clears throat> moving on, you know, uh, Kishore, I mean, a uh, remarkable playbook. And as I mentioned, you know, as I have studied your career and the three stages in it, and if I'm uh, as an author, if I may, I mean, each of them, each of your stages of your, each of the stages of your career, have been phases of tremendous forward motion, you know, for you. And you've grown rapidly in every phase. So we often see people hit a mid-career slump at organizations, you know, when they hit 40 or 45, they just stop growing, uh, not just professionally, but they also stop growing personally and also philosophically, if I may. So with you, however, you know, whenever I've studied you, I've seen that you always found new frontiers for yourself and you reinvented yourself with each decade in each decade of your professional career so my question kishore is what's your advice to mid managers on how to stay relevant and navigate through stages of limbo if and when they will arise and i'm sure they will arise for every mid manager every other mid manager and how do they define their next career milestone kishore you know it was a I think if I look back, when I came to India first with GE, the energy business, we had uh, literally no business, right? And it, it was a, the question to ask was very fundamental as to why. So, I mean, when you look at things and you say, why, what, when, where, and how, I think everything starts falling together, right? So when we, when we ask the question, so why is it that we are not able to go? You can always find excuses and say, well, there's no market, there's no gas, there's no this, that. So then you start saying that, so then what is the answer? Right. And then you start peeling the onion saying that where does, you know, where is the business? Where is it we can go get the business? How is it we can go get the business? Right. And when will it actually happen? To be honest, when you looked at it in 2004, I don't think there was any, uh, any visibility to the natural gas availability in India. Then you talk about 2008, fast forward, India was just full of natural gas stocks. Right. But the question is, by which time, by 2004 to 2008, we should have known that we have the product. The market doesn't exist today for this reason. But what if the market comes back? How will we be positioned? Sure. Right. And then these are the scenarios that have to be built. And these are sometimes just scenarios built in the head. Or these are sometimes scenarios that are experimented with. Right. And I think that, those are the two things that were there. But today, when you look at the defense business in India, I think defense is a field where when I first looked at Rolls-Royce in 2012, I think uh, we were all talking about selling in India, right? We had the uh, Hawks that we sold in India. We had the Jaguars that we had sold the engines on. We had the C-130Js that came in. And so we had all these engines that we could sell on. And all we need to do is fit our engines to an aircraft uh, frame. And here we are in India buys. We are following the market. But then you want to be a market leader. You got to be able to change what the market should be. Right? And so what we all embarked on was a journey where we said, and it was, look, again, it's a market that has to be available. Just like natural gas availability mattered there. What mattered is impetus from the government in the defense business. So when the Modi government came to power in 2014, they started talking about Make in India. Yep. And then when Make in India came about, it became very obvious that they're going to push more and more of not buying imports on the defense side, but making them as much as they can within India. Defense is controlled by the government, so it's very important for India's national security. So it lent itself very nicely to it. Now the question is to see how, where aerospace will fit in there. Where will the marine technologies fit in there? Right? So the question is now you've got, you are now peeling the onion. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then you go further from there. Then you say, okay, so I got products to sell, but what do you do with the products? Oh, I can go assemble it in. So there was a phase where there was assembly possibilities that was happening in India. Right? Then the question became one, and you saw Atmanirbhar Bharat come about in 2018, which is self-reliant India. And when you look at self-reliant India, then the question is not about basically assembling in India, it's about creating in India. Yes. 
And when you talk about creating in India for total self-reliance, you need to have the IP. And if you need to have the IP, it means you're going to create locally. And so the concept that needs to be built out is co-creation. And that caught a lot of steam during COVID times because it was obvious during COVID that countries that did not have the self-reliance were struggling. Yes. Right? And India also said, this is very, very important for India to have self-reliance. And we had to go in as Rolls Royce, pitching in what we can do for them. Then create that market space. Right? And so then when you open that market space and you create that, you're generating IP, then you don't have any competition at that point in time because you're creating IP and then you, that competition has to be created in a different form for somebody else. If we did it, so you create markets. So you have to create markets when there's no market. So you have a product. So I look at it as three streams. You have a product, you don't have a market, you have to create the market. You have a market, you don't have a product, you have to create the product. When you have a market and you have a product, you need to scale it. It's as simple as that. Right, as long as you keep this in your head and you keep marching forward, it works. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. I mean, you you make it sound so simple, Kishore. I mean, I'm sure it's not that simple, but at your level, probably you know how to simplify it. And for the viewers, you know, not every day do you have some business leader who hangs around with uh, the ex-British Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Johnson. You know, Kishore. Kishore has been, you know, as I said, he's been uh, named as one of the main leaders who has strengthened the UK, uh, India business ties, uh, trade ties, uh, and he's been awarded the officer of uh, 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 in the order of the British Empire, which is a very, very uh, prestigious, you know, title for any Indian. We are so proud that Kishore, we have worked for you and uh, for this. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, Congratulations, Kishore. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm sure that all Indian leaders who were listening into you, Kishore, and we had a brief uh, uh, discussion on Indian leaders and, uh, and why we need to talk more about Indian leaders uh, and make in India, Indian leaders who are contributing to India, people like you, Kishore. And uh, so we need to have this conversation going more often because Indians generally walk into the sunset. It we can blame it on the conservatism of our culture or whatever it is. We don't like to talk much, write about ourselves, write autobiographies, etc. So, uh, I mean, India is always perceived in this binary narrative, like in the land of the Gandhi or Taj Mahal, or where cows sit on the street and you are, where you can't trust the drinking water, like I said, or where, you know, you have uh, economists who teach at Harvard or where you have Dabba Wallas who are studied by Harvard. So in between these two extreme views about India, we've got leaders in India and we are talking to one such leader here who are in India, building India and taking India to where it rightfully belongs, Kishore. So, you know, my next question, Kishore, is on inspiration. And uh, I, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but I had quite a number of conversations with you on books and inspiration and role models. And I especially remember one conversation with you in your office in Gurgaon uh, on Marshall Goldsmith's What Got You Here Won't Get You There, that book. And you had given me a rundown on the book and I, I, I read the book the very next week. So you are obviously a business leader who inspires a lot of people. Now, this question is not about whom you inspire, but this question is about who inspires you and who has been or have been your role models, Kishore, and if you can share some books that have shaped your philosophy uh, with us, Kishore. Wow. It's a tall order because I'll tell you what, I read books that are very varied. It is not, uh, you know, I, I have read the, I have not gotten into the second book of uh, Noel Harari, but the first book was so phenomenal, I don't want to forget it. I read it like three times already. And I want to make sure I understand exactly what he's saying there before I move to the second and the third books. And then I have fourth, fourth Kishore, sorry. And fourth, 21 lessons for the 21st I, century. No, that is the third. I am reading his Nexus, which came out just on 10th of September, which is about AI. And you should read it, Kishore. It is, it is double. I, sorry. Like I said, he's a phenomenal writer and I'm a big fan of his. And, um, you know, when I, when I look at leaders, look, every leader has something to offer. You can't just say, I pick one leader. And every leader has something that there's a deficiency with. So people used to say, I want to be like Mahatma Gandhi, right? He was very truthful. He had his right things. And now you will see that he also did mistakes in his life, right? And, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to go in there and you have to be able to 
take a lot of readings, which means you can look at Steve Jobs, you can look at Bill Gates, you can look at uh, Ratan Tata, and I, or you can look at Ram Jait Malani. You can look at phenomenal people, right? I mean, and uh, at the end, it's you got to pick up what is it that they have done or they have that applies to you, right? If we don't turn it inwards and if we don't reflect on it and basically say, this is why, you know, I can be that leader or I will never be that leader. Do I have the same uh, foundations that Steve Jobs had or Bill Gates had? They were in their garage. They had no money. They were not interested in the education. They were not interested in a, they were not coming from a culture where at that point in time, education was everything. I came from a culture where if I don't go to college, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Whether it's right or wrong is a different thing. But the thing is that what we need to do, how did Bill Gates drive himself and what did, what caused him to reach to where he went? Sure. What did Ratan Tata do? He came to really troubling times for the Tatas. Right? He came in with a vision, with a dream. And finally, in his lifetime, he achieved the dream of bringing Air India back into the Tata fold. Right? Absolutely. And so there are a lot of things that we can learn from many different people. So I think it's a question of how do we how do we reflect on ourselves? And that's where the leadership piece of things is purely about authenticity. We need to know who we are. And there are certain things I can never do. And there are certain things I will never do. Right? But as long as I know what I cannot do and what I will not do, then life becomes easier because my window becomes smaller for me to fly through. True, true. Right? Absolutely. And I, I think that's why I, I, I struggle to say that, look, this is the leader that motivated me. If I say that and say Ratan Tata motivated me, then why didn't I become Ratan Tata? And if you're going to ask the question after saying that, then you ask the question saying, who am I first? And sure. then you go back and reverse and say, what is it I have in common with what Mr. Tata? Sure. And what is it I can do that he did? How can I do that? And same thing, you compare yourself with others. I think it's very, very important. And a lot of people miss that, I think. I think I've been lucky enough, like early days, I've been uh, taught that 10% of my time should be given to me, myself, and the things that I did that particular day. If on an average you can give out 10% of your time towards that, I think it helps a lot. It brings a lot of clarity to life. Excellent. So well said, Kishore. And, you know, uh, and this is such an authentic answer because you know, I, I, I totally endorse this and I, I, I agree you know, as someone who's followed you and uh, you know, studied you at close quarters. And I know that you walk the talk. You are, uh, and you all often mentioned about that. You know, you didn't mention it now, but you mentioned that your parents and your upbringing in India that has a big, big, uh, big role to play in in how your mindset developed in terms of. You know, it also it it's not just about the influences out there. It's about what you are tuned in to accept as an influence. So I think that's where your background and your upbringing comes in because your upbringing probably, you know, tuned in to accept the right influences because today we are living in the generation of influencers as we, as they say, you know, they're every, every other guy or a, or, or, a, or a lady is an influencer out there and they, they, they come in and, you know, they, they make tall statements without any real experience of life. And I think that's where you need to have real role models back home where you can actually be prepared to absorb the right influences that the world is offering to you out there. So thanks, Kishore. And I think, sorry. No, no, I've been very lucky. I think uh, parents usually teach the child to walk and uh, bring them to a stage where they are actually running. And then it's the family that takes over and it's the support of the spouse and the kids and everybody else around you, your friends. I think, um, you know, at the end, if people understand that they are living in a world where it's going to take, you know, the strong support, not only that the early stages of learning, but through the entire journey, there's got to be support systems that have to be formed. And as long as the support systems we understand have to be formed and are formed properly, it becomes easier to execute. Absolutely, absolutely. Totally agree. And, and you know, which a point you mentioned was very important, Kishore, and which is... Uh, knowing yourself, you know, you should know yourself before you go out looking for inspiration outside, because, you know, people, you know, that's the disconnect we see often these days, especially in this day of days of Instagram and social media, where, you know, leaders peddle to what is 
trending rather than what is real. And, and, and that's why organizations fumble quite often because, you know, they go after the latest trend and the fad and they don't work on the fundamentals. They don't know what they stand for. And I think, you know, old, old leader, I mean, old school leaders, and you have been somebody, Kishore, you know, I, 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 I was mentioning about Indian leaders and you have been somebody who worked and grew in one of the fiercely, most fierce, comp fiercely competitive uh, American organizations in history. GE in the 90s. And you actually grow, grew through the ranks being an Indian there. So I'm sure that the values back home uh, kind of helped your learning and your and your journey there, Kishore. Thank Great answer, Kishore. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kishore. So now before I, you know, there are a lot of audience questions coming in. So before I get to the open the floor for the audience questions, Kishore, I wanted to, I was, this is also a personal curiosity and also the, you know, audience would like to know. Could you share something about uh, what's uh, about Rolls Royce's South Asia journey and the role? Because I know that you've transformed a lot in, in Rolls Royce, how it, it is in the global scheme of things. So what's the role that Rolls Royce South Asia is playing in the global scheme of things for the organization? Well, look, India is a very important market. Rolls Royce is not in automobiles uh, like many of the people would like to think. So we are in the civil aerospace, we are in the defense, we are in the power systems business. And now when you look at these businesses, civil aerospace is a very long cycle business. Defense is a very strategic long cycle business. And power systems is a short cycle business. And we all, all these three businesses, what we work in today, it is extremely important that we align ourselves to the Indian market. We have the right products for all these three businesses that are willing to hunt in India. And we need to make sure that we are able to leverage, as the market evolves, we are able to leverage our products here. And in that regard, we are very thankful that we have the Air India deal recently. We have the Indigo deal very recently. And so our white bodies, uh, presence of Rolls-Royce uh, Trent XWB engines um, has increased in India a lot. And it's going to keep increasing. So the white body market is now prevalent with Indian carriers. And that's we are very thankful for that. And then I think when you talk about the defense business, we are into co-creation. We are trying to work with the government, how to build a combat engine, right? We are trying to figure out how to bring marine technologies for the aircraft carrier, the frigates, the destroyers. We have 7,200 nautical miles of uh, coast, coastline in India. And so that requires a lot of protection from uh, geopolitical you know, challenges. So I think, uh, so we're working with uh, the relevant authorities in that regard. Power systems business is growing with the data centers, right? That is all coming up in India with it as, as data centers, which has become a global phenomenon is now catching up in India as well. And then we talked about smart grid some time back, I think as, a, as early as 2013, it was too early for the times, right? But today smart grid is a conversation that will have products going, sure. right? So I think uh, at the end of the day, all the three businesses are doing very well for us, but it also meant that we also needed to increase our people presence in the country. So we have a very strong digital team that's here delivering the globe. We have a strong business services team that's here. We have two joint ventures. We do manufacturing here where the parts are actually exported out and used globally uh, from India. And so, I mean, if you look at the overall portfolio, when I started in 2012, uh, we were a trading outpost, right? And today we are a very good operating business here, right? And so that's a big transformation that we have been through. And we continue to transform and change ourselves, you know, in India. Because India is a constantly evolving market. If I look at 2013, I look at India 2024. I mean, it's just a very different day in India out there. Right? Sure. The governments are different. There's a very strong leader now. There's a very strong focus from the government to the markets. We have to realign ourselves to India's needs. And we have to make sure Britain, UK is also very supportive. And we've been very lucky because UK, we have been able to generate a lot of interest with UK MOD been able to generate a lot of interest with the UK companies to come and do more business in India. We have been a role, uh, you know, sort of Rolls Royce has been the uh, guiding light for a lot of companies as to how we can do business in India, what we can do in India and how we can grow in it. We started looking at strategies and we put our first strategy paper out in 2013. We constantly look at the next 10 years. How can we build our supply chain? How can we build on the existing bases we have? How can we put in more people? I think all those are being thought about because why? Because India is very important. Why is India very important? There's 1.4 billion folks in India. Absolutely. 
And that hope is what drives driving the GDP of India. And that hope is what will drive MNCs in India. That hope will continue. That light will continue to shine. And people who don't partake in that light, you know, will have to probably see the others grow. Right? And that's point, that's a very simple, easy answer. But then that's what it took, uh, what I've been doing for the last uh, 12 years. Right? It's uh, building the foundations upon which the company can scale up and sustain. And uh, so GE was similar. And I think Rolls Royce has been similar. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Kishore. I think, you know, you kind of uh, added to the pre one of my previous questions when I was asking you, how does a leader redefine himself or herself as they go through different stages of their leadership journey? And I think, you know, the way your leadership playbook, when, at, when you were at G, called for a different set of attributes as a leader. You had to grow a business where you had a product line available and you, you didn't have a market. And then the market came in and you had to marry both of them. So, and then you had to lead that. And uh, we these days we talk a lot about, about energy transition, but GE under you in those days, like 13, 14 years back, it was actually a role model for energy transition. We had different PNLs. Uh, one was power generation, one was controls, one was uh, wind, one was, you know, so, uh, so we had individual PNLs leading each of those under you. And we were actually living the energy transition 14 years back under you. That called for a different set of attributes, but at Rolls Royce, like you explained, from uh, which was more of a large trading outlet, you have transformed and under you, Rolls Royce in India has transformed into a full-blown organization which has manufacturing in the country aligned to the trade ties between the two governments. You are a backbone for the digital initiatives for your other parts of the world. So that is what probably leaders need to graduate into after they have done a full-blown PNL. I think, you know, that's where the value is because people feel disillusioned, right? Because after you land on the moon, what do you do after that? So you, you have to find a new frontier for yourself, right? So I think, Kishore, you've been lucky to have cracked that. So fantastic, Kishore. Thank you so much for the great answer. I'll, I'll, I'll just start reading all the questions, a lot of them. I hope we can do justice to all of them. Uh, there are a lot of comments as well as questions. I'll, I'll try to read out. Pradik says, hello. Swati says, hi. Uh, Fahad Mir says, thank you, Ayan, sir, for inviting such a great leader. So glad to be part of this community and listening to Mr. Jairaman. Uh, Juhi is saying, sir, what would you say is the one thing that has driven your success the most? I, I think the hard part of this question is the one thing, right? Okay. And I don't want to give an answer which says, here's the one thing and give you three things. Sure. But uh, the, the only thing is to constantly strive for outcomes. I think, you know, we have to keep saying, what does winning this look like? And then put that, pin it up on the wall, that becomes a North Star, go after it. Right? To make it simple. It's not that simple. But to make it simple, I'm saying that because it's one thing. Right? But if you do not have that, I think it becomes very hard. You become confused. There's no clarity. And um, then it, it just gets harder and harder. So I think that would be my answer. Super. So Juhi, you know, to, as I mentioned earlier, you know, incredible sense of uh, this intense desire to win, which I have studied in Kishore. So you have to define what winning looks like. I think that's what uh, Kishore said was his North Star always throughout his career. So once you decide what winning looks like, you go after it. So Zaid is saying, Mr. Kishore, when you started your career, did you ever imagine that you would lead such iconic companies was it the journey that led you here or did you have the vision from the beginning of your career? I wouldn't call it a vision. I'll say I had a dream. I'm not trying to be Martin Luther King here, but, uh, but in principle, I mean, I wanted to grow. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be, you know, but I could not define what success would be because this job, I do this job very well. Then I know what I want as the next job. And then you meet people who become mentors, and these days people just use the word mentors and say, will you find yeah. yeah, I mean, they basically say, will you help me find me, find the next job? That's not mentorship. So in my view, mentorship is about guiding you in the right path 
so that you decide what your next job has to be. But you know, understanding who you are, the whole idea of forming a mentor-mentee relationship is so that you understand who we are dealing with both sides, and then we basically try to help the mentee from the mentor's eyes. And um, and I think it is it is uh, there is a in some ways hard work and opportunity meet right and opportunity is luck so at some point always in everyone's lives hard work and luck meets and when hard work and luck meets be ready to grab it with both hands that's all it takes and then go execute Super, super. Yeah, of course. You know, when opportunity meets hard work, that's where luck happens, and 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 you have to grab it at that point. You can't uh, mull over it or just think that you know we'll do it I, some other day. I mean, I mean, if you think I'm 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 just uh, shooting from my hip on that. The opportunity that came to me was to come to India. Sure. Right. And the reason why the opportunity came to me was what I was doing in Atlanta at the time for five years, which was pure hard work. And so when this opportunity came, I took it. Did I know that I will grow? No. Was it a dream of mine to do that? Yes. And so then you come in and you do everything else we talked about. Yep. <laughs> and you build and you build an organization around around yourself. So I think Zayed, you know, I, I have worked under Kishore and I can tell you that G used to have a lot of leaders in those days, but Kishore was hands down the most popular leader we ever had. You know, he was loved by everyone, every employee in G in that time. And I'm sure it's the same with Rolls Royce. So Sunanda Mathur is saying, how difficult is it to move across cultures? And uh, what sort of adjustments did you have to make? A lot, a lot, because you know, See, when I was growing up with the Indian culture, there is a certain way of doing things. There was a certain imposition on all of us as Indians as to how you can work, how you can speak with your boss, how you can behave with your family. There are a lot of constraints being imposed in those days in my view, right? And now when you go to America, there's a lot of things which say so you have to be creative, you have to be thinking, it's all about application, it's all about solving. So the thinking becomes, and the, the, the agility with which you needed to perform there was very high. The adaptability was very high, right? Then you come back, then you have you adopt to a different culture, the European culture, which is, and it all stems into the capitalism in the US, to the socialism in Europe, to the Indian, which is somewhere in between, right? And so people tend to work differently, definitely based on where they come from. But the goals do not change. Business is business. Sure. Right? If a business does not get in revenues, or if the cost is higher than the revenues or the margins, no business will survive, period. It's as simple as that. You don't have to go too very complicated into the rest of the math. So you need to figure out, so how do you get the revenues in? Or you need to figure out how do you keep the cost down? Right? Okay. And then you just... Put the whole picture together right how difficult is it it is very difficult it is easy easily said than done but but then that is what differentiates a person from the others and uh, once the differentiation happens and you figure out a secret sauce and the secret sauce is nothing very complicated it's just between these two two little bars right. and then and then things start coming together right they start coming together, you got to figure out what's the next step. And I'll tell you, everybody in their life reaches a point of complacency. Right? Everybody reaches a point where they just do it, get too comfortable with things. And then that is the beginning. Right? Either you change the curve or you start going down. And I've been lucky enough to change the curves. Absolutely. absolutely. And, you know, uh, Zayed, I mean, so Sunanda, just to answer, uh, to add to Kishore's point, I mean, uh, this gentleman has led 
people across cultures and it's not just south asians or americans or europeans i mean across the board he has led people and like he said like kishore said you know business is business and also people are people human beings will be human beings so they are all the same below the colors of the skins and passports and i think if you know the right triggers uh, what drives human beings and like leaders like kishore do and i think you can drive any culture and any team i think in the right direction so thanks kishore great answer marian is asking you uh, so do you have you ever felt stuck in your career and when you first started did you ever consider changing paths and taking a different direction oh yeah of course <laughs> 1999 everybody in the us was talking computers everybody was talking about you know moving into the world of the internet right mm-hmm. california was booming dot com and, and i was in steel mills right i was doing process controls or at that time i was doing project management in steel mills which is a ancient industry right. right and everybody was in computers at that time gateway computers was there and friends of mine were working there everybody got all the stocks options i consider changing it and the only reason i couldn't change it was because i never went from be mechanical engineering to a ms in computer technology i did a be mechanical engineer and a masters in mechanical engineering and my core was mechanical engineering and i loved it so you know this is when all my hard work there as project manager come 2000 there was an opportunity for me to move to the energy business and so it was power systems and i moved to the energy services business in atlanta a completely shift of fields after 11 years of being an expert in the you know, steel mill industry hot strip mill specifically into energy business which i had no clue about i was learning turbines i was learning all the nozzles the vanes the shrouds uh, and i had to figure out all these mechanisms so but then you go ahead and you learn right and i think the one thing is that change will always keep coming and we have to be able to change and i think uh, as much as i don't like change i think i have seen more change than i wanted to see and uh, and it's only for the better you know pick up pick up the hard ones pick up the hard problems pick up the things that uh, allow you to learn and i think we have to be the best at what we do At the end of the day, it matters. Then you got to figure out the rest of the world around it. Sure. And someone like you, I'm sure that you you never stop learning. And I'm sure that you know, with your sense of curiosity, I, I'm sure that you'll keep on learning, Kishore. As you, I, I don't think we have a choice. Yep. The day we stop learning, I think, uh, is the day we start, uh, you know, sort of fading away. and i mean fading away not from a corporate point of view or a business point of view fading away as human beings correct very true very well said so i i don't see that as a choice so well said yeah i think that's where you know relevance is very tricky and it's fleeting you know once you you are at the top of the world and tomorrow if you are not learning or staying abreast with what's going on in the world and then you are suddenly you find yourself uh, falling behind the world and uh, uh, you have never fallen behind so i am sure so i want i this is not an audience question this is a question i wanted to ask you earlier i forgot to ask you so do you have any plans kishore of uh, like you mentioned mentors and mentees so do you plan to formally get into mentoring professionals as you go into the next stage of your career well i am still trying to find out what would that mean right i'm happy to do it right i've thought about teaching very much so yes i've thought about consulting i've thought about advising and i do serve on the advisory boards of universities now because i find that as an avenue towards figuring out what should the education system look like what is it i can do with uh, students more because the minds their minds are much faster than mine their knowledge is more relevant to today than mine in the domains they are in so i find that that will be very exciting to learn from right and then when you look at leadership have i thought about coaching have i thought about being a coach i've been trained to be a coach right but you know what is training of being a coach i mean so there was really no formal training or something i've been to a lot of programs that have been run by rolls royce where we've been taught that okay this is how you coach and we have had all this exercises but the point is have i thought of being a coach yes every day i'm a coach every day i'm a mentor 
would I do that for a living? I mean, I've not thought about that piece. Right? But uh, I think every day I have to do it in my job. Yeah. I mean, these days we have so many, you know, it's an overflowing market of coaches they are out there and who don't who are not authentic who don't have real business experience so the the business world could really gain from somebody like you kishore who has real business experience if you could share it with younger next generation leaders i think that would do a great deal of good for the industry we need authentic leaders like you to coach the next generation so darthi uh, darthi uh, wider is saying how did you handle the challenge of getting a global giant like g to work seamlessly with a psu like bhl great question uh, what were the challenges uh, of two different cultures to work together i love that question but i'll tell you why you have to understand what are the drivers for the people that work in different organizations so when you look at a public sector unit in india they are all very intelligent people they are all very very honest diligent hard working people they are in a system that also creates them to be within boxes and as long as you understand that these people are intelligent hard working playing within the boxes provided to them with equal ambition like anyone else then you start thinking like them you start working like them you start building with them and uh, it's a long story but then yes i find my my uh, journey with the psu is very rewarding i met some great people bhl and now with rolls royce i've been working with hal extensively right and uh, and so you know interestingly on i met uh, some bhl folks uh, just uh, probably a year back yeah. and they still remembered me and i was surprised of course, they will, they will. Of course. <laughs> they still remembered me and i was like really very pleasantly surprised but the thing is that i think uh, you know Uh, people brand it and uh, you work with the government of india it will be very different you work with the government of the united states it will be very different right yes. because they are all in a system they are all in a box that they have to play in i am in a box that i have to play in with folks correct okay? so we all have the boxes and we just have to figure out what is the how do we find an intersection between these boxes and it's that intersection that you have to keep going and bhl of course you know bhl and g partnership is a very very you know lucrative partnership and a win win for both organizations i think and and i i remember kishore that you used to be a very big uh, relationship uh, owner with bhl those days prashant used to own the bhl uh, uh, sales relationship and i would remember every other day you would be you and prashant would be going and meeting bhl at their office etc so i i remember that and as you rightly said although it is steeped in bureaucracy but indian public sector consist contains some of the brightest individuals from the indian uh, you know uh, indian talent pool and once like kishore said when you tap into the right triggers i think it's very good to work with them there's some great great people there so varun is asking you kishore rolls royce has made significant strides in aerospace and defense what role does digital engineering and ai play in shaping the future of these industries a huge role a really huge role because look when we do manufacturing each turbine blade we store about a petabyte of data and all this data that goes in there what do you do with the data right it could be used for our future products it can be used for current products it can be used for upgrading previous you know the previous generation products so there's a lot of data out there and there's a lot of information available and all we need is to have the right algorithms in play ai is just a tool right i mean we can call it artificial intelligence but it's actually human intelligence in a intelligence in a box right but regardless right it's all it's teaching them teaching how to interpret the data and how to extrapolate the data as far as you know i'm concerned with the world i deal in today but when i look at it i think as we move into the future it's going to be huge for us in trying to figure out how we can have digital twins that will reduce the cost in building new facilities and optimizing production processes in making sure we have what new products come out how we are able to use the past history of our products to generate new products that will not have the same problems so and then from there on extrapolate to what is out of the possible into the future so i mean there's a, it's a field that is just uh, emerging in a lot of ways 
and i believe that we have a very strong team here that uh, that has been built since 2018 and uh, now the team is performing phenomenally for us super super this is a question on generations narayanan is asking you gen z is very difficult uh, different how do you deal with this lot you have got two gen z's at home so uh, i'll be very very honest with you now i used to think about baby boomers then i had the millennials beyond that i lost i lost track <laughs> lost track of generation gen z gen y gen xers everything came about and i'll be honest i'll i'll trip on myself if i if i say anything about it let's put it this way think about it in my father's generation there was no telephone telegram was what was used and there was no tv communication was all important the village was everywhere around you population was hardly 2 billion or 3 billion in the world right so the whole life was very very different look at my generation population was at about 3 billion 4 billion right we started having tv in the house we started having computers that started coming up and then we started moving now i look at the next generation right those kids have grown up not with ipads but they have grown up with computers right and they have grown up with very strong television part they have grown up in a way that society is molded very differently through the programs through the tools that are available to sure. and i see today kids that are born and whenever i fly now all the kids uh, that are flying right to two year old three year olds the parents are very happy to put a cartoon and put it on the ipad and give it to them so they growing up with ipads correct correct and tomorrow who knows what they will grow up with and that is going to shape who they are because they are interacting with so much of information and that's why probably when we talk about it day on you said nexus is all about the information age correct right and i think information and how we interact with information is going to change the culture that we all live in and that is what is happening in that is in my view that is a generation gap because information is different because the culture is change and as the culture changes the previous culture the previous generation which is a one culture does not understand it so there is a gap but if you understand the gap and we try to look at it from a different view point life would be easier which i have not figured out yet and i'll be admit to that it's very hard for me to see things very differently than from the generation to it but what i have to be is empathetic to them and not sympathetic in some ways i do feel sympathetic to them but uh, because i think our generation was a privileged generation but i think uh, you know when i look at them and i say that look they are the victims of the information and the drivers around themselves and i am the victim of my own box that i have sat in i had to jump out of my box into their box understand their box and that's when life becomes so much easier that's what i think about the gen zers and gen xers and millennials and baby boomers the one thing there is constant for everyone they all come to they all age they all mature they all experience and everybody comes to the same convergence of this is life exactly exactly and eventually it's all you know it's life just life it's like that so uh, so yeah i mean it's intergenerational awareness which is very important so and it works both ways i think and i think the gen z's are uh, i mean i wouldn't say that they are they are also much more aware than what we were because of the sheer information that they have at their disposal so i have seen you know when i was a youngster like 25 26 year old i was much more intolerant towards many things i had very strong opinions and you know i was very rebellious but i when i look at somebody like my daughter for example i mean she has a world view which is much more broader than mine so i think that's an advantage of a of a gen z i i think so and uh, so if you can tap into the right sensibilities i think it's not that difficult so so uh, there are a few questions on technology kishore is they are saying that you have led high tech organizations you know they are asking you is there any specific challenge uh, in any other sector i mean can you just uh, i mean is there uh, a similarity or difference in terms of challenges between high tech orgs and uh, not so high tech orgs so i think there are challenges on both sides right high tech has its own challenges in high tech the answers are not readily available in low tech the answers are available and the, the implementation methodologies are harder right so it regardless of what it is i mean you can either say that i got a problem i don't know the answer to so it's going to take me so much of time i got a problem i know the answer to but it's going to take so much of time to implement it at the end of the day the challenge is the same the toughness is the same you're going to take a certain amount of time to get to the end result so as long as you know that i got to get to the end result you can accelerate it or decelerate it 
technology side is a little harder because the challenges you know are something are totally unknown okay and they you know getting to the root cause becomes a lot harder in high technology areas like for example if you have a problem in the aircraft engine it's not an easy solution it is a mechanical problem it is a mechanical solution should exist for it but it's not going to be as easy as saying that you know something just broke down on something else right so it's it's a question of how you define the high technology items low technology items how you define the problems and uh, if the problem on the low technology side is human beings i think it's more complicated than high technology problems sure of course so it's all it's a very you can just generalize it but i think challenges are challenges and it depends on what the challenge is very well sir i think gayatri nair is asking you a similar question gayatri you are she is asking about the disruption going on in the aerospace industry and how does rolls royce stay ahead and i think kishore you kind of answered that the challenges across you know it's human challenges technology challenges so there are just two questions very similar uh, and we'll probably wrap it with that so arav and uh, pratik are both asking you that you know Uh, uh relationships between uh, has I, i like this question and pratik i think your question kishore has answered in some form he is asked pratik is asking you about attributes of a successful leader i think you've kind of answered it in many forms in the previous answers but arav's question is interesting and we'll probably take this as the last question how has the relationship between india and the uk particularly in terms of trade and tech innovation influenced rolls royce's strategic direction well look india is a growth market today we are talking india is the fifth largest economy and uh, i think soon enough we'll become third largest economy correct so i don't think anybody in the world today can ignore india as a credible uh, growth partner and the needs in india have also changed the needs of the external world has also changed now when you look at uk i think uk has a lot of great manufacturing processes products and uh, india has the, some phenomenal capabilities and capacities and i think you know the question is how do you marry these two together and i think at the end of the day both sides have to look at it and say what is a win win solution to this problem i mean our services industry has done very well right and they have really shown the world how services can be done from a place like india and what india is really capable of if you do a similar stuff in the manufacturing side i think we will be even even bigger and even better and it's going to happen so as we grow from uh, 3 trillion over to about 5 trillion and then over to 55 trillion as i read the latest uh, in the year 2050 this growth is coming from four big pillars right exports from india infrastructure development in india is we're coming from private consumption right and uh, private uh, private spending and uh, you know it is also it is it is also something where if you just take these pillars and you apply to it the hopes the ambitions the needs and the wants have all changed the information that is available to people in villages today is driving them to think about a brighter future for themselves is giving them hope is giving them ambitions is giving them goals this is a change in whole philosophy what never used to be there so whenever people say india has challenges it's because we have 1.4 billion people and you to bringing 1.4 billion people channelizing them is going to be very very hard but this 1.4 billion people have dreams have aspirations have goals and that is what is going to drive our economy to the scale that we are talking about and that is what the government has as a challenge is to bring all those hopes together create those jobs out there make sure that the education system exists for them make sure the infrastructure exists for them and make sure that we are working with the world in this whole it is not going to happen if we just have domestic consumption it is going to happen along with exposure and so i think i think it's i think the future looks very bright to be honest and i think uk india relationship us india relationship these are all the bright spots but leave but that is not what it is all about it is also about our relationship with the african nations it's all about our relationship with the asian nations and i think india has now become a credible player a trustworthy player a partner a friend a brother not only to the western world but to the developing economies so uh, all this just tells me that you know for the next 20 years the next two decades please in my foreseeable future um you know it it's a shining star absolutely so so well summarized kishore and i i i i pick a phrase from one of your earlier answers 
1.4 billion hopes. I think you know that that's what is going to drive India and the current government in India under uh, Prime Minister Modi. I think this is probably the best positioned government which can probably make this transition that Kishore was mentioning because it has a will and it's a government that acts. It course corrects if necessary, and then you know it keeps act, keeps acting. So that's very important for any government in this this period of the curve of a, of a country. So so well said, Kishore. It was such a pleasure, Kishore, listening to you. I mean, after so many years, and the question I asked on mentoring: if you decide to formally start your mentoring or coaching academy, I will be your first student, Kishore. And uh, so so thank you. And you know, this this is a platform called Thinkly, formed by uh, one of my friends, Vivek Saxena, who is. And this is uh, it hosts curated content from some of the leading thinkers in the contemporary world, including Nobel laureates. And and many others, you know, the who's who of the contemporary world. So so I mean, we were privileged to have you uh, speak to us, Kishore, today. And thank you so much for your time and for your lessons, timeless as always. And you have never lost touch. You're just getting better. Well, Aeon, thank you very much. It's really a privilege for me to be here with you guys. And uh, you know, I think uh, it's a great opportunity to share some thoughts and share my journey with you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Greatly appreciate. Thank- Thank you, Kishore. And thanks to your team, extended team, Gayatri, who's your VP comms, and the others who have helped uh, put this session together. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.